Empirical provide compelling, interactive learning across a range of delivery options. Live on site, live online, or online anytime, we have a training course that is ideal for you. For a no-obligations chat about your training requirements, contact us at empirical.com. In this module, we're going to turn our attention to the 2020s and the technological evolution of 5G. Now, to begin with, we're going to focus on some of the concepts and drivers for 5G. Why is the network as it is, and how will it actually operate? So then, back in 2003, the ITUR set about the design aspirations for what a 4G system should be, and they termed this IMT Advanced. This was later picked up by the 3GPP to set about producing the technical specifications for a 4G network, and we know this as LTE, long-term evolution. We've also seen that LTE has advanced over the uh, forthcoming years in terms of LTE Advanced and LTE Advanced Pro. And now we lead towards 5G, or new radio. As far as the ITU are concerned, they also set about advertising the design goals and aspirations for what a 5G system should be. And this work actually began back in 2012. So then, what are these goals and aspirations for a 5G technology? Well, to begin with, we can break it down into different use cases. And the ITUR gave us three different use cases for 5G. Enhanced mobile broadband, massive machine type communications, and ultra-reliable low latency communications. So let's just take a moment to look at each one of these in turn. To begin with then, enhanced mobile broadband is all about providing high-speed data connections wherever we may be, not just in the city centres, but also suburban and rural areas. It also should make sure we get high-speed connections at things like sporting events in stadiums or potentially concerts. Moving on to massive machine type communications, this is all about the Internet of Things and using the 5G network to connect millions, if not billions, of devices and bringing the information to and from the various sensors. Again, this is a key area in terms of 5G development, hitting this Internet of Things traffic. And finally, we have ultra-reliable and low-latency communications. And we could actually break this down into the two different components. Communications that requires ultra-reliability, for example, we often refer to the five or the six nines, 99.9999% reliable. And low latency communications, communications that require a very short period of time for the information to pass across the network. Examples would be things like autonomous vehicles and also tactile internet. So, looking at those different use cases, the ITUR then map them against these eight different performance criteria. Remember, the ITUR didn't actually define how the network should be built, just what criteria they should be able to achieve if they wish to call themselves a 5G technology. These eight criteria then include the peak data rate, but we should also experience the user experience data rate as a more accurate way of indicating the data that you and I would typically receive. We have spectrum efficiency, how many ones and zeros we can carry on the radio wave. We have mobility, the speed at which the device can move and still maintain the connection. Latency, how long will it take for the information to pass across the 5G network. Likewise, connection density, the number of devices within a geographical area. Network energy efficiency, how much electricity is the network going to use, but also the device. For a number of cases, this device will be battery powered, and this has a large implication, particularly for IoT devices. And finally, area traffic capacity, the volume of data that we're going to send, again, for a geographical area. Consider a sports stadium and all the fans watching video replays of a goal. 
For each of these criteria then, they were ranked as either low, medium, or of high importance. And we can see for the three different use cases how the various priorities lie. So for enhanced mobile broadband, clearly the peak data rate and the user experience data rate is going to be important. Likewise, spectrum efficiency in terms of the volume of information covering this use case. Mobility, we expect to be traveling on high-speed trains and still maintain our connection. However, for latency and connection density, this becomes slightly less important for this type of use case. But network energy efficiency, clearly reducing the amount of electricity, our digital or digital carbon load, and also area traffic capacity. We're back to the supporters in the stadium or watching that video download. However, for massive machine type communications, we can see it's a very different profile. Connection density is of high importance and network energy efficiency of medium importance. Remember, these IoT devices may be operating on batteries and we would expect these batteries to last for up to 10 years. However, peak data rates, user experience data rates will typically be much lower. We don't expect these IoT devices to be sending large volumes of data frequently. And finally, ultra-reliable low latency communications. Well, not surprisingly, mobility, if we're talking about autonomous vehicles, plays an important aspect and latency clearly by the uh, definition of the name. However, once again, peak data rate, user experience data rate is less important. We don't once again expect to see these devices sending large volumes of data frequently. So collectively across our IMT uh, 2020 network, we can see a real mixture against these eight criteria defined by the ITUR. Okay, so now looking at the comparison then between IoT Advance, which was our 4G system, we can see here representing it with some certain figures. For example, we have peak data rates of 1 gigabit per second on our 4G system, user experience data rates of 10 megabits per second, mobility at 350 kilometers per hour, and latency at 10 milliseconds. Comparing this to 5G, well, not surprisingly, we've seen an improvement across all eight criteria with peak data rates now moving towards 20 gigabits per second. However, we should stress the user experience data rate is more likely going to be around 100 megabits per second. Remember, wherever we may be, we should be expecting this sort of data connections across our 5G networks. Likewise, mobility up to 500 kilometers per hour and latency down to one millisecond. So we can see here quite a nice comparison the way that our 4G networks, IMT advanced, are migrating towards IMT 2020 or 5G. Now for many mobile service providers, the first iteration of 5G has been termed non-standalone operation. And we can see from the diagram at first glance that this doesn't really look like a 5G network. In fact, what we have here is a 4G architecture our mobile phone connected through to an E node B and then back into the Evolve Packet Core, made up of the MME, the Mobility Management Entity, the Serving Gateway and the PDN Gateway. So how can we call this 5G? Well, one of the real rationale behind this was so that mobile service providers could introduce a 5G connectivity without having to build an entire 5G network made up of a 5G RAM, the radio access network, and a new 5G core. Therefore, non-standalone operation will add a new 5G radio. And we term this the G node B, G standing for new radio. But note, the G node B connects back towards the E node B, and we refer to this as the master, and in this case, the G node B being the secondary. But the Geno B will also connect back to the serving gateway, but only for user plane traffic. The key thing to stress here is that the control of this device, which now supports both the 4G and the 5G radio interface, is still held in the 4G core network, the Evolve Packet Core, the MME in particular. Now, there are many different options that are available for introducing this non-standalone mode of operation but by far the most common is referred to as option 3X. So let's just take a moment to see how the traffic flows across this 5G non-standalone operation mode. 
To begin with then, on the red line, we are indicating the way the data will flow. So from the packet data network arriving into our cellular network at the PDN gateway. And from here, it will be tunneled down to the serving gateway. And as far as the red line is concerned, this is following traditional 4G connectivity. From the serving gateway to the E node B, and then across the 4G radio or air interface down onto our device. However, with option 3X, we will also support a secondary data flow, in this case illustrated in blue. Once again, coming from the packet data network through the PDN gateway down to the serving gateway. But here now, the data will flow and be sent down to the G node B, the 5G radio node. Here, the traffic will now be split, with a proportion of that traffic being sent across the 5G radio or air interface down to our new device, capable of supporting both radio links. But the remaining data will be sent up towards the E node B and across the 4G radio link. So what we're doing by adding the G node B and 5G here is fundamentally giving us a capacity boost, enabling the device to go into dual connectivity mode and add a 5G base station to the existing 4G radio link. Now an example of this type of configuration would see VOLTE, voice over LTE traffic, being carried on the red bearer. However, the internet would be carried over blue. So therefore, when connectivity enabled it to happen, when we moved into 5G coverage, then we could increase the capacity of the system for our internet connection. Need to know more? Why not visit our store where you can choose from over 200 hours of video-based training? Alternatively, you can contact us to discuss any specific training requirements you may have.